Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we will discuss about pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism means obstruction of pulmonary artery or its branches because of thrombus, tumor, air or fat. Okay. The emboli can normally the emboli originates from the uh, DVT of lo, uh, leg. Okay. Very rarely it can present from a, uh, other so sources through uh, foramen oval uh, or atrial septal defect. So, pulmonary embolism no, in a normal course develops uh, the thrombi develops in uh, deep vein uh, veins in the lower lung and it ascends up and go to the uh, one of the arteries and block the pulmonary uh, circulation. Okay. Clinical presentation, there are three types of uh, clinical presentation for pulmonary embolism. One is acute, suddenly patient come with uh, severe breathlessness, chest pain, uh, hypotension, all these things. This is called as acute pulmonary embolism. Second one is subacute, it takes some more time. Uh, slowly patient develops uh, breathlessness uh, following the initial event. Uh, multiple embolism can be there in the pulmonary arteries. Third one is chronic. It takes longer time, uh, years together to develop a uh, full-blown uh, pulmonary hypertension in that type of patients. So acute, subacute, chronic types of pulmonary embolisms are seen in clinical uh, scenario. Okay. Now we'll see what are the risk factors for a pulmonary embolism. Whatever is the risk factor for a DVT, same thing is applicable for the risk factor for a pulmonary embolism. Okay. So, we have acquired causes, inherited causes. Inherited causes are factor 5 laden mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, protein C and protein S deficiency. These are the inherited causes for uh, pulmonary embolism or DVT. The major cause for acquired uh, pulmonary um, embolism or DVT are prolonged travel history, immobility like patient who is admitted in ICU for a longer period or in ward for longer period they can have DVT or pulmonary embolism. History of DVT is another uh, risk factor for pulmonary embolism. Obesity, smoking, previous surgery, trauma, hormone replacement therapy, uh, oral co contraceptives, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, malignancies, old age, all these things are acquired cause for pulmonary embolism or DVT. Okay. Now we will see what are the clinical features especially in acute pulmonary embolism. Symptoms like patient can have history of DVT in the recent past. Sudden onset of breathlessness is a classic uh, finding seen in pulmonary embolism or pulmonary infarction due to the infarction in the blood vessels. Okay. Patient present with cough with hemoptysis. Most of these patients present something like a pleuritic chest pain with pneumonia but uh, they may not have uh, infection uh, like screen may be negative. Patient can have breathlessness, pleuritic chest pain, syncope. Syncope is mainly occurring in the massive pulmonary embolism and reduced cardiac output. So symptoms are mainly patient may have DVT, chest pain can be there, pleuritic type of chest pain can be there, severe cough, hemoptysis, breathlessness, uh, syncope, all these things are features of uh, acute pulmonary embolism. Signs like tachypnea, uh, hypoxia, cyanosis can be there. M many patients can have tachycardia. If you take an ECG there also you can see the commonest finding will be tachycardia. Hypotension occurs due to RV failure. Massive pulmonary embolism you can have hypotension. JVP can be elevated. Loud P2 is a clinical sign. Acute corpulmonal is seen in uh, severe pulmonary embolism and low grade fever because of the tissue infarction and inflammation. Okay. Now, once you get a suspected pulmonary embolism, you have to score the patient according to Wells criteria or modified Wells criteria. These criteria are available in the uh, uh, Google. Uh, you can Google that uh, uh, score and uh, find out the scoring system. According to the Wells criteria, uh, you have three categories high, moderate, low. High is more than 6 score, moderate is uh, 2 to 6, uh, low is less than 2. That tells you whether patient is having, having a high probability for uh, pulmonary embolism or low probability for pulmonary embolism and uh, you have modified Wells criteria. In that uh, there are only two scores, pulmonary uh, embolism likely or unlikely, likely is more than 4, less than 4 is unlikely. So this is called as Wells criteria and modified Wells criteria. Okay. Now, once you admit a case of uh, pulmonary embolism or suspected case of pulmonary embolism in emergency room, following investigation should be done. Okay. Somebody is having cough, breathlessness and uh, tachypnea, tachycardia. Initially, you have to take an ABG. Most of these patients will have tachypnea. Because of tachypnea, their oxygen level may be slightly low and uh, carbon dioxide may be washed off. 
So, both PaO2 and PaCO2 can be reduced. Okay. ECG mostly shows sinus tachycardia and atrial fibrillation, RBBB, RVH, all can be there. Suppose there is a massive pulmonary embolism. S1, Q3, T3, that is a classic finding but not seen in all cases. S wave in lead uh, 1, Q wave in lead 3, T wave in T wave inversion in lead 3. These are the classical findings but you may not see these findings in all pulmonary embolism. So, ECG mostly shows only tachy sinus tachycardia. That is a classic uh, common finding seen in uh, pulmonary embolism. Okay. Now, every patient who is having uh, pulmonary embolism and uh, DVT, uh, most of the doctors do D-dimer. D-dimer is elevated in pulmonary embolism and DVT. The range may be more than 500 nanogram per ml. But remember that it is not going to tell you that pulmonary embolism is present. If it is negative, you can rule out pulmonary embolism or DVT. So, it has got a negative predictive value. Plasma D-dimer ELISA test should be done to rule out pulmonary embolism but not to diagnose pulmonary embolism. Okay. So, ECG we have already discussed S1, Q3, T3 is the classical finding but you may not see in all the cases but sinus tachycardia is one of the commonest findings seen in many patients. If there is a massive pulmonary embolism and RVH you get RBVB, RVH and atrial fibrillation. Okay. Now, we have to take an X-ray in emergency room for pulmonary embol suspected pulmonary embolism following findings can be there. Um, uh, many patients you can see the uh, uh, area of pulmonary embolism diaphragm can be elevated. Oligemia of leg lung field is classically known as Westermark sign. A uh, wedge shape opacity is seen in uh, above the diaphragm is called as Hampton's hump. Many patients with pulmonary embolism can have pleural effusion on the side of the uh, embolism. Uh, you can see some patients enlargement of pulmonary artery. So, there are two classical signs, Westermark sign and Hampton's hum. This can be seen in some patients, but this is not seen in all type of patients. Oligemia of lung fields at the, uh, at the area of the infarction is called as Westermark sign. Elevated uh, opac sorry, uh, op opacity seen above the diaphragm uh, is called as Hampton's hum. Okay. Now, echo, echocardiogram has got a role in acute pulmonary embolism. Uh, you can diagnose massive pulmonary embolism by doing echo. You can see uh, the RV size is enlarged and uh, RV functions can be reduced. Tricuspid regurgitations are seen in enlarged RV. Okay. So, some uh, uh, important findings can be picked up by uh, echo if there is a massive pulmonary embolism. Okay. So, McConnell sign is a classical sign. Regional wall motion abnormality that spare the right ventricular apex is classically seen but not in all cases. Right heart thrombus can be seen in patients who is having DVT and uh, sending pulmonary uh, embolism from that DVT to lungs. Okay. Now, we have to go for imaging studies. Ventilation perfusion scanning is the one of the commonest uh, uh, investigation done in wards for pulmonary embolism. There you match the ventilation and perfusion uh, through a VQ scanning machine. You can see VQ mismatch. Normally uh, ventilation and perfusion is normal in any uh, lung tissue, but in pulmonary embolism ventilation is normal, but perfusion is reduced. This is called as VQ mismatch. That can be observed in patients with pulmonary embolism. You can uh, do an MDCT chest uh, that may tell you uh, some, uh, some findings uh, in pulmonary embolism. But the best investigation, gold standard investigation in pulmonary embolism is CT pulmonary angiogram and angiography. Th that should be done in all patients who, whom you suspect pulmonary embolism that can detect even a small emboli of 1 to 2 millimeter. So, CT pulmonary angiogram is the best imaging investigation uh, in pulmonary embolism. VQ mismatch can be there in pulmonary embolism. Ventilation uh, is normal, perfusion is reduced. Okay. Now, once you admit a case of pulmonary embolism, you should find out what is the reason for that. Suppose the patient is already having a prolonged bedridden state or who, who has traveled uh, a long distance, uh, uh, then th there is a possibility of uh, DVT and pulmonary embolism because of that itself. Suppose there is a DVT, that may be the reason. Suppose you are not finding any reason for pulmonary embolism, you have to do a procoagulant workup, whether any reason is uh, there behind the uh, uh, formation of a emboli. Okay. You can do antiphospholipid antibodies, fasting homocysteine levels should be done, flow cytometry should be done to rule out PNH. 
factor 5 laden PCR can be done. Prothrombin can, uh, test can be done by PCR. But remember, there are three, two investigations you should avoid in acute condition, protein C and protein S level. Uh, you know that uh, it can be reduced in acute uh, infarc infarction or acute embolism because uh, it will be utilized to lyse the thrombus. So protein C and protein S will be normally reduced in and antithrombin will be normally reduced in acute condition. So avoid this investigation but most of the books give that you should do this investigation. Falsely it can be reduced in acute condition. So protein C, protein S, antithrombin can be falsely reduced in this condition. So you interpret these results with caution. Okay. So in, now, now we will discuss about initial management of pulmonary embolism in emergency room. Okay. So like any other patient, you take the patient in inside emergency room and take care is airway, breathing, circulation. Talk to the patient. He should be, uh, he should talk to you and check the saturation. Saturation should be normal. If there is hypoxemia, start the patient on oxygen. Morphine can be given for pain, but uh, there is a chance of hypotension in massive pulmonary embolism. Try to avoid morph morphine in acute pul pulmonary embolism with hypotension. Fluid should be given in a patient who is having hypotension with uh, pulmonary embolism. Norepinephrine can be used after fluid challenge. Then dobutamin should be added if there is a cardiogenic shock. Okay. Now we will go to antithrombin, antithrombotic therapy. Heparin, heparin is the ideal drug. Initially you give 5000 units bolus and 1000 units per hour infusion can be given uh, in a peripheral center. So 80 units per kg bolus, 18 units per kg per hour infusion should be started. Keep the APTT two times above the control. Okay. So heparin should be started immediately uh, once you get the uh, pulmonary embolism to emergency room if you are working in a peripheral hospital. Okay, low molecular weight heparin can be uh, started instead of heparin. Uh, it has got some benefits. In, there is no need of no, no need to monitor the APTT. Enoxaparin 1.5 milligram per kg daily into five days can be used. Fondoparinox is another alternative. It's a factor. 10A inhibitor can be used. Okay, so along with the heparin, you have to always start warfarin because warfarin take time to act. It takes minimum seven, five to seven days to act. So start warfarin along with heparin. If you don't know what is the reason for uh, DVT or pulmonary embolism, start warfarin along with heparin. The initial dose of warfarin should be 10 milligram per day and taper the down taper down the dose according to the INR values. You keep the INR around 2.5. Okay, now we will discuss about thrombolytic therapy. If you are working in a tertiary care center and if the patient is having massive pulmonary embolism, you can go for uh, act, uh, tissue plasminogen activator. The dose is 10 milligram per IV bolus, 10 milligram IV bolus and then 90 milligram infused over 2 hours. That is a dose. Alternative drugs are streptokinase and urokinase. TPA is the ideal drug. So thrombolytic drug uh, can be given in acute pulmonary embolism if you are working in a uh, uh, tertiary care center. So we have discussed about pulmonary embolism. The major cause for pulmonary embolism is immobility, uh, Im uh, immobilization and DVT may be the uh, like uh, sending uh, uh, D from DVT only most of the patients develop pulmonary embolism. Patient come with acute chest pain, acute pleuritic chest pain, cough, hemoptysis, Massive pulmonary embolism can produce RV failure, acute core pulmonary hypotension. Okay. Initially, take the patient inside and stabilize the patient. Uh, ECG may show classic S1, Q3, T3 finding, but it is not very common. Echo can be done to rule out RV enlargement. Uh, some patients uh, will be treated with heparin, with warfarin. Uh, and if you are working in a uh, uh, tertiary care center, if the patient is having massive pulmonary embolism, you can go for thrombolysis uh, uh, with TPA. Thank you. Subscribe to AATCM Emergency Medicine on YouTube. Press the bell icon to follow us.